about the rock stars of science, right? Well, here we go. Let's, uh, let, let, let's start <laughs> off this way. Uh, joining us now, Stephen Dukoski is Dean of the University of Virginia School of Medicine, pioneer in the early detection of Alzheimer's. Ron Peterson, director of the Mayo, Alzheimer's, Mayo Clinic's Alzheimer's Research Center, expert in mild cognitive impairment, early diagnosis. He was uh, Ronald Reagan's doctor, although don't try to ask him uh, whether he thinks that uh, Ronald Reagan was afflicted with the early stages while he was president. I tried to do that on camera. They didn't get anything. But I, I figured I'd try. Because it's, it's worth it. He'll write his memoir someday, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Gandy is the Mount Sinai <laughs> professor of neurology and psychiatry. In addition to his uh, work on Alzheimer's, he's also working with the Veterans Administration on returning veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, which is, a, of course, such a serious problem. And Jeffrey Cummings is the director of Alzheimer's Disease Research at UCLA and innovator in the measurement of brain function. So let me just start with the question, how does it feel to be a rock star? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's kind of a unique place to be. When, when they did the original spread for uh, T2 and the heat death, the outstanding joke was that uh, we would do this and agree to do it even if you told no one could see it. He was a neurologist or a scientist because most of us don't wear T2 shirts in humor. Um, but it has gotten a lot of attention, a lot of kidding as well. But everybody who kids it understands the reason for trying to get uh, more attention paid to science globally and to the specific disorders that we are interested in and focusing upon being healthy for the countries of the world. Do, do people see this campaign? Do, do, do we have a sense that? Uh, oh, yeah. 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 Pretty well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're still seeing it. Yeah, for better or worse. Right? <laughs> so there's a lot of competition to be a rock star yeah. now. You know, this is this is this was a good thing in the community because there was a lot of uh, people who wanted to be rock stars once this thing was uh, started ripping. I spend a lot of time telling people not to think about uh, what we call false dichotomies, that there's one thing, or if you do this, you can't do that. Um, I would say there have been immense breakthroughs in understanding mechanisms of disease, the genetics of those that lead us to therapies and ways to do therapy, huge advances in accurate detection of disease, and probably for me the biggest, uh, the entree to true prevention, ways to detect the disease in people before they develop any symptom, uh, when if they're asymptomatic and we can stop the disease and slow down its progression, holds great promise. There's a piece of why it's not either treatment or prevention. It is very likely that the drugs that we develop for treatment are going to be those, assuming that they are safe enough, to give to people who are asymptomatic because we know their risk of developing the disease is big and it's worth giving them the medication before they ever develop symptoms. So those have two outcomes that are very useful. But like a statin pill turned rock star? Well, something like that. Uh, certainly uh, statins, hypertension medications to avoid heart disease, kidney disease, stroke, and so forth, things that would stop the disease before it ever got to a clinical manifestation. Um, we don't use statins acutely yet, uh, at least for heart attacks, uh, but, uh, and we don't think they're terribly effective for people who have the disease, but they may have a way to slow it. Um, but we would take it either way. Um, it is likely that the first drugs we would try in large scale for prevention, other than the ones we're experimenting with now that are relatively safe and relatively inexpensive, because we don't know who who would commit to take a drug in the prevention trial for a number of years might get such a disease. Um, we, uh, we would like to know uh, the drugs that are effective in, in treating the disease, the ones we're working on now, would they be appropriate to give to a population and try to wipe the disease out? Yeah, that sounds fun. perspectives. One is sort of the clinically oriented, patient oriented type of research that, that I do as a clinician involving imaging and the like. And on the other side is the basic science, the guys in the laboratories who wear the white coats and have the uh, laboratory animals and the, the beakers and test tubes, and, and, and they're working on the underlying mechanism, what's going on in the disease. And so I see what's happened over the last 
decades or so, is that both of these lines of research have really advanced to the point now that we can probably identify people who are at risk for developing disease, either early symptoms or perhaps even on the cusp of developing symptoms. The folks in the basic science laboratories are at the brink of what we can do about that, the development of the drugs, the treatments to really have an impact on it. And unfortunately what's happened is as the science has moved forward, now the funding has gone south. So I think we're at that precipice where we really could make an impact on this disease if in fact we could get an infusion of funding to bring these two lines of research together now so we have the cadre of patients who are at risk for developing it. We now can intervene with a disease modifying therapy and make a difference. I mean, I think uh, uh, from the way I perceive it, I doubt, I'd like to think we're gonna develop the aspirin for Alzheimer's disease, but maybe not. So the therapies that are going to be developed, and I think they will, that are disease modifying therapies, may be a little pricey, and may be a little risky. So we're going to have to stratify individuals based on their risk. And I think that's where a lot of the research now is sort of coalescing and, and pointing to the direction that we will be able to develop a risk formula that this person has a 0.8 probability of developing Alzheimer's disease by age 70. This person has a 0.3 probability. Now you're going to be allocating the expensive and perhaps risky medications, you'd probably give it to the 0.8 person and maybe not the 0.3 person. I think that's where the field is going Risk more than anything else. Yeah. And funding, where would funding look like? Well, uh, funding I think is really crucial for uh, getting to the, the point of prevention that, that both Steve and Ron have mentioned uh, in, in their uh, comments. The prevention trials that we'll have to do for this disease will be, will be some of the largest and most expensive trials ever conducted for any disease because it, uh, for any trial that goes on now, even for an 18 month trial, typically costs $50 million for each drug. Um, and you know, to try and expand that over a whole cadre of drugs and uh, get to the point, those are treatment trials. And the real issue now is how to get from treatment trials to prevention trials, because we can't perfectly predict who's going to get the disease. Uh, Ron mentioned the, the odds ratios. The real challenge though is that we have medicines now that are, are coming into treatment trials that we think may very likely be successful if we could get them into prevention trials. And how do we operationalize getting from here to there? How early is early enough? Because if we go from 65 to 55 and then follow that cadre of patients until they're 85, that's a 30 year experiment. And if we should have gone to 50, will have wasted that 30 years or at least missed that 50 years, uh, 30 years. So making these sort of projections and finding the funds to support research that goes over longer than five year increments because we need to go 20, 30 years to do a prevention trial for Alzheimer's disease. Because it's big bang for multiplex energy. Absolutely. Yeah. Gary, you asked about the, the part where the best ideas that you know, scientists regard their ideas like uh, parents regard their children. So mine are the best, and Bukowski's are probably, you know, kind of uh, questionable. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so I, I think the idea actually is that we all have a lot of good ideas. Uh, that's, that's part of being a rock star, and there are many other scientists in the field who have a lot of ideas, and we have to encourage them all. That's why the funding has to increase, is we can't decide which is the best idea. We don't know which is the best mouse model. We don't know which is the best drug. We don't know when, when the, the best time to start treatment is. And we have to have everybody working on this project so that we can advance the whole field, early intervention, biomarkers, therapeutics, uh, relationships between pharmaceutical companies and academic medical centers. All these things have to be advanced together. That's why the excitement of the Alzheimer's disease study group has come through. This is a programmatic approach to advancing prevention and treatment, advancing the care of the patients who have the disease now. We cannot abandon, the, abandon them and moving the research funding along in, at, the, at the congressional level. So <coughs> if, if, if one thing's apparent to people is that the disease started long before symptom commenced. And one of the things we've truly identified now is that it starts probably at least a decade, maybe more. Um, and people were puzzled by this, I think, and we never thought about it because we were so involved with the immediacy of finding uh, what was wrong with someone who came into the clinic with a short-term memory loss. So if we, but if we switch the conversation to heart disease, which is one of our models, it all makes sense. Everybody understands that 
heart disease often starts uh, by um, lack of exercise or due to some genetic influences, lipid, hypertension, uh, a variety of things that lead over 10, 20, 30 years to heart disease later in life. Increasingly, we look at Alzheimer's disease like that, and the cardiac physicians have done the work over the past 30 years to result not only in medications, but also in other kinds of advice, not just drugs, but advice for everyday living, which we are increasingly looking for as a way to direct people to. Many of the cardiac risks turn out to be Alzheimer's risks, a great deal of different ideas about what's, whether it's two diseases or it's somehow those lipid changes also predispose to Alzheimer's. But the idea is everybody gets when you see a successful model of being able to decrease your risk of heart disease through life, give prevention drugs, statins are a classic example of that for uh, later life disease. And we're moving down that line with that as one of the blueprints for Alzheimer's, which is one of the reasons why you'll constantly hear us move back and forth between treatment for people who have manifest disease. We don't yet have sense for uh, the equivalent of an arterial bypass graft for Alzheimer's disease. We want drugs that are powerful, don't have them yet. And back and forth to the earliest detection and the immediate institution of some kind of preventive intervention. Now, what I want to wrap up with, I, I did a story for Nightline on, on, on uh, uh, community gospel church, so I can't say that I, I, I love to have you. But, you know, when I, when I did, I tried to communicate this sense uh, that the horizon is brightening. And the reaction that I got, I must tell you this, no, it's not. Alzheimer's is a dark and sad thing. And people just didn't believe that, that with the kind of efforts that, that we're talking about, that horizon is, is brightening in, in a time frame that we can grasp. I just want to talk about Alzheimer's. I mean, I think we, we need to convince people that this is a modifiable process. It need not be a passive process of aging. I think there still is the perception that say, oh, this is just aging. You know, there became senile, grandma became senile. Well, grandma may have had the underpinnings of Alzheimer's disease. And this need not be a passive process. The lifestyle modifications Steve was referring to are really coming to the fore that in fact we can do something about preventing cognitive decline down the road. And the heart disease model, I think, is, is a good one. Uh, but it took them decades at the same time. I think we have to accelerate that process. And that's why we really need the increase of funding now. So I think also that the, the time frame that makes people skeptical is we know it takes about 10 years to get a drug from discovery into the FDA for approval for treatment on the market. So 10 years is a long time. That means the science that Steve and, uh, and, and, the, and Sam and, and Ron are producing today are going to lead to drugs 10 years from now. But we can accelerate that process, for example, if we can get lots of people into clinical trials. So one of the things that patients and families can do to accelerate drug development is to participate in clinical trials. And we're having trouble getting that message out there. We're having far too few people participate in clinical trials. And that, of course, means it takes longer and longer to test the drugs that are going to lead to new treatments for old age. Next to time we have, Sam. So, Terry, the, the cardiac model is, is more than just a model. Uh, this really, these, the cardiac risks do actually contribute to risk for Alzheimer's. So in the same way that controlling cardiac risks eventually led to a decreased incidence of stroke, I think there's a reasonable chance that we control cardiac risk factors, eventually we'll see some impact of that on the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. We know now that if there are people who have, have both vascular disease and Alzheimer's, if we treat their vascular disease very aggressively by managing their risk factors, that will slow progression of dementia. Quick comment about that. As we wrap about it up. The, uh, Jeff's comment Jeff is, is that uh, uh, people who say are diagnosed with cancer, it's not at all uncommon for them to enter into a clinical trial at a university or a medical center. We don't have that mindset in Alzheimer's disease. We have to change that. Get involved. Well, you guys are involved, ladies and gentlemen, the, all, the rock stars of science. Thank you.